Hello everybody, I wanted to send out a quick video just to unpack something I said Sunday that has unintentionally created quite a stir among a lot of people. And honestly, I, I, I never say anything on stage that is intended to be provocative or edgy. I'm not, I'm not trying to get quoted, none of that mess. I just wanna teach God's word and teach it with hope and with, with possibility. And one of the things I said was, is in the context of the culture we live in, many people without realizing it have redefined Christianity. And what we're going through right now in a series called Counter Culture is we're talking about how Jesus spelled out in what we call the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter five, he spelled out what the kingdom of heaven looks like, the entry points into the kingdom of heaven. And the first one he said was, is blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And before I got to that, I talked about the reason why it was so important for Jesus to talk about this. And one of the reasons why is because uh, pursuing God in that culture, in the Old Testament still kind of ending culture, there's a lot of things that were not in the Old Testament that people were being told to do. And then there was the, the influx of paganism and all these different things. And so Jesus is saying, hey, look, what you think is spirituality and what, I, and what the kingdom of heaven is, is way different. And you slowly get off track through very small steps. So I talked about how there's a lot of people in the world who have very different ideas of what Christianity is. And a lot of them really aren't backed up by the Bible because the Bible says we are Christ followers. And many people who claim to be Christians are not following Jesus, they're following themselves. And so how did we get there? I really think it's inadvertent. It's, it's not on purpose. It's very small steps. And I had different reasons why. But one of my reasons, I think, is because there's things the Bible prohibit but we really like, or we really think that maybe God made a mistake. And so because we love Jesus and we love the idea of salvation, we tweak the Bible a little bit to fit us. And then I said it. The Bible says to abstain from all forms of sexual immorality. And sexual immorality, the, the Greek word is pornea. And the way you look at that is it is a blanket statement to say and yes, that is where we get the word pornography, but it was a more holistic phrase. And there's other places in the New Testament that bear this out as well. That what God's word is saying is you abstain from all forms of sexual activity outside of the heterosexual union of a husband and wife, as laid out in Genesis 1 through 3. And that created an uproar. And here, here's my thoughts on this and the reason why I wanted to talk about this today. And that is... I feel like without meaning to in the church world, there's a lot of sneaky little kind of hidden in the back room beliefs that we've heard the Bible says, but we don't really like to talk about those in uh, polite company. We just say, well, I think that's what the Bible says, but I'm not really sure, but I, I feel this way, or I feel that way, so I'm really, really gonna talk about it, and we don't talk about it. And I'm wondering if maybe that has done more harm than good because it creates a lot of trouble and so instead, I think what maybe we ought to do is start talking about it and just say, look, I'm not mad at you. I'm not condemning you. I'm just saying this is what the Bible says. And if you're a Christ follower, that means you follow what God's word says and you leave your opinion out of it. So maybe you're not a Christ follower. And I'm not mad at you, but you need to know what the truth is. So then you know what to do. One of the things the Bible says is to abstain from all forms of of sexual immorality. And there are three main areas that has blown people up that I wanna talk about really, really quickly and why I'm willing to even do this on a uh, public platform, okay? Here's the, we're gonna talk about homosexuality, we're gonna talk about pornography, and we're gonna talk about fornication and adultery and everything else outside of a heterosexual you and a man and wife. Let's talk about homosexuality first. The Bible is very clear that God loves all of us but there are some things that attach to us there's attitudes there's addictions there's things that attach to us that is considered sin it goes against the divine order that God has set up unfortunately and I say this with great pain one of those is being a homosexual a lesbian transsexual all those things God has something better for you and according to God's word that is of brokenness. Romans 1. You know, we can go into all these different other scriptures where you can act like they've reinterpreted it and it doesn't mean homosexuality. It means pedophilia. First of all, it's not true. 
if you want to challenge me on that, that's okay. I'm not mad at you for it. But one of the reasons why I have learned how to read Greek is because I wanted to know for myself. I've read it. I've studied it. It's not what it means. But in Romans 1, I think the genius of God is Paul doesn't use that word homosexual. Which, by the way, I've heard people say, well, the word homosexual didn't even exist until they put it in the Bible. Well, you know why? Because it was part of the English language that they hadn't, that they were trying to figure out how to say what that Greek word said. So just because the word didn't exist, it didn't mean they didn't know what it was. Okay, don't, don't go there. But in Romans 1, you don't even have to go there. Paul starts with saying, God created all of us. We fell from the perfection that he had for us. And because we turned away from our creator, we started to turn toward all the things that we wanted to do. And he even goes into examples saying, because of this, men left their natural affections that they had for women and they turned toward other men. Women left their natural affections and turned toward, and he's saying, this was not the way God made us. And so he doesn't even use a specific word to get you all tripped up. He describes what it is. And so I'm so sorry to tell you that. And you know why I think it's such a, a horrible, horrible topic to talk about? It's because maybe you're like me. And when I think of the LGBTQ community, I don't think of an abstract thought. I don't think of something random, you know? I think of a person. I think of someone that I love. I think of someone that is a great person, that has endless value. And so for me to tell them that something that feels so right to them is not what God's best is for them creates immense pain in me. And I don't want to do that. But here's the thing. I don't get to make the rules. God's word is what it is. And we don't get to redefine it. You know, for 2,000 years, people have been reading God's word that way. You mean to tell me in the last 25 years, we come up with something different that's changing everything? That for 1,975 years, they've been getting it wrong? No, that's not true. And for everyone out there who's watching this and you're you're in an LGBTQ relationship. I'm not mad at you. Please don't be mad at me. I'm not saying, I'm not, I, don't, I don't hate you. I love you. And it's okay if you don't agree with me. We can still be friends. But I need you to understand that's what God's word says. I think in Christianity for so long, what we have done is, is we have hidden the truth of God's word. And we just said, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Don't worry about anything else. Come to Jesus. And definitely that is the message. But it's almost like saying, hey, I want to sell you a house. Well, what's in the house? Well, I don't, don't matter. Just come buy the house. Well, then you buy the house and you walk in and somebody else is living there. <laughs> and I think we've done that sometimes with Christianity. We say, come get saved. Come get saved. Well, what does it mean to be saved? doesn't matter. Come get saved. And they get saved and they go, well, God says we shouldn't do some stuff. Uh, I don't like this anymore, so let me change it. Can we do it this way? If you believe that Jesus loved you enough... That because you couldn't forgive your own sins, he said, I will go. I'll put on a flesh suit. I'll live for 33 years and I'll die for your sins. You can't do it, but I can. That if God loved you that much, does it also then mean that everything he wrote in this thing we call the Bible, that maybe those things are for your good as well, even if we don't always fully understand them or don't like them? Do you know where I got all these ideas from? Not from some chauvinistic male, whatever, whatever. I got all these ideas from a guy named Christopher Yawn, who wrote a book called Holy Sexuality and the Gospel. This person is someone who says, I am a gay man that is living for Jesus. And what he said is, and I love this, he said, the goal of Christianity is not heterosexual. The goal of Christianity is not to get married and have a flock of kids. How disrespectful it is for us to tell people who are homosexual that you need to be like me and be heterosexual. Absolutely not. <clears throat> the goal is not be, to be heterosexual. The goal is to be holy in our sexuality. And it just so happens that Jesus, in God's word, he ratifies it in the New Testament because it was already there in the Old Testament. God's word says, holy sexuality is the union between man and wife. That's what holy sexuality is. I would highly recommend this book to you, okay? Don't, don't take my word for it. Read the word of God and read someone who's lived and walked it. I tell people who are homosexual all the time, I have no right to act like I know what you go through and what this does to you. That's why I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm right here. I'm going to stand with you. But I can't not tell you the truth. I love you enough not to lie to you. Okay, that's the first thing, okay? Please, 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 please read this book. Read it. The goal of Christianity is not heterosexualness. It is holy sexuality. It turns out to be holy does have a definition when it comes to sexuality. It is between a man and and why? What Christopher Yan is doing is he doesn't say that you give your life to Christ and all of a sudden, if you're a guy, you're going to start liking 
uh, ladies, didn't say that. He said, my goal was not to become heterosexual. My goal was to become holy. And since I don't like women, I'm celibate right now. How can you take away my sexuality? I'm not. I'm not. I'm trying to give you Jesus. Okay? It's very hard. Very hard for me to even say, but it's true. Second thing is pornography. Very easy to understand. It is objectifying other people. Jesus said, if you lust after someone in your heart, you've already committed this sin. Very, very difficult. And you know what happens with pornography? It does so many horrible things, but probably the worst thing in my mind is it takes people out of being a human being created in the goodness of God, and it turns them into an object. And that's not what they are. Women are made in the goodness and likeness of God, and they deserve our respect. For women, men are the same way. And so pornography perverts the goodness of God. And then the last one is heterosexual sin, fornication, adultery. Pastor, it's just a one night stand. Pastor, it's just a physical thing. It's not, it's not. The Bible says all the way back in Genesis that a man shall leave his wife and they shall become one flesh. That's not just physical, but when you have sex with someone else, you unify yourself with them emotionally and spiritually. If you don't believe me, if someone will have a really honest conversation with you, they can remember having sex with someone who is not their spouse years ago, and they still think about it from time to time. You know why? Because something spiritual happened. Something emotional happened. And it, it is impossible to un -one something that has been won. Think about it like having a sheet of paper and gluing them together, and then trying to rip them apart. No matter how hard you try, once that glue has, has, has dried, you're going to get a little bit tore off over here and a little bit tore off over there. That's what happens when you have sex with someone and then you separate from them. Is You give them a piece of your heart and now there's a wound there that only God can heal. And so what Jesus says is don't do that. I'm trying to help you. Here's a roadblock here. Here's an issue. Here's a thing. So I'm not saying that's easy, but I am saying that's what God's word says. He's trying to keep you from having pain. And so what, what does God's word say about sexual morality? Is that anything outside of the heterosexual union, a husband and a wife, is not God's way. And you know what we've done as a church? Is we've dropped that bomb and we've walked away. No more. No more. I, I dream of a church where we can be fiercely loyal to God's word and fiercely love people at the same time. To say, this is not God's best for you, but I'm not going anywhere. If anyone leaves, it's you. I want to figure this out with you together. I'm going to cry with you. I'm going to get mad with you. I'm going to go through all of this, but I'm not going anywhere. And if it takes the rest of our lives to figure it out, we'll figure it out. Well, what happens if someone is struggling with this sin? Well, here, here's the thing. There's two different things. They're struggling with the sin, and then they're celebrating that sin. If someone's struggling and trying to figure it out, man, we walk with them. If they're celebrating and saying, nothing's wrong with me, I love you, but I may have to put a boundary in place because... You're no longer trying to follow the same Jesus I'm trying to follow. And I'm not mad at you. And this is not an us versus them. I'm just saying it's not the same thing. Now, the last thing is, is for all the criticism that I get, for these, these conversations should happen offline. These should be one-on-one -on -one conversations. Okay, I want to say this with all the love that I have, but I'm going to say this. And maybe I don't have to say it anymore. And if you've made it this far in this video, <laughs> thank you so much. I'm challenging the church. You're lying to everyone and you are letting yourself off the hook. You know why? Because I do have those conversations with people and I cry with people, I weep with people, I walk with people and you know what they tell me? I've had Christian friends for years and they never told me about this. So for all of you who tell me we shouldn't be having these conversations out in the open, do you know why I'm having to have these conversations out in the open? It's because there are some of you out there and I put myself in this category that all you're doing by saying we should do these one-on-one -on -one is it's a cop-out because you're not talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. And they're living their lives thinking that they're doing the right thing when they're not. And I don't know what that means for them in eternity. I really don't. And I really don't want to think about that. I don't sit in the seat of anyone in, in judgment. I just sit in the seat of trying to help people. But I am done with all these people telling me that we should save these for one-on-one -on -one conversations. You're right. In a perfect world, these would be one-on-one -on -one conversations we have over a cup of coffee and we would sit side by side and hold each other and cry and, and work through God's word together, but you're not doing that. You're saying that, but then you're not living it out. And so until you do, I'm gonna keep making videos. And I don't mean that as a threat. I don't mean that mad. See, see, see my eyes. See, I'm walking this same struggle with you, but I am done 
with people lying to themselves by saying, we should do this in private, but you're not doing it. And so I'm, I'm sick of seeing people hurt. And so my, my dream is, is that we define what Christianity is, and then we do it. And if we can't do it, well, then let's not call ourselves a Christian anymore. But that's what we, we're here to do. And so I love you enough, as much as this <laughs> is painful to do, to tell you. And so let's grow together. I hope this helps a little bit.